I wanted to continue on today with something that started, like I said, on Palm Sunday, um, the triumphal entry. We started to talk about worship. And uh, here we are three weeks later with part two. But that's okay. Um, to, to look at a, a definition of, of worship, I looked up some of these. Reverent honor and homage paid to God. To feel an adoring reverence or regard for any person or thing. So worship is reverence. It's a recognition of what is worthy to be revered. It is honor. It's a recognition of what deserves to be honored. Worship is gratitude and thanksgiving. It's a heart expressing thanksgiving, thankfulness for who Jesus is and for what he's done for us. It's a recognition of worth and it's adoration and affection. You know, whatever is vying for your attention is vying for your affection. And there are a lot of things to look at in this life. There are things that are trying to get pieces of your heart to bring you into despair when God says that your portion is the oil of joy. It's the oil of gladness. This section over here has it. <laughs> Everybody get up and move over to this section. <laughs> of, of the list I've just talked about, many if not all of these terms actually refer to the heart. We know that worship is more than the 30 minutes of music and song that we sing on a Sunday morning. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is expressed in everything we do, in word, in thought, in deed. But, but it originates in the heart, and then it manifests itself in an expression. So worship as it starts in the heart, as an understanding that he is worthy of it all, and then manifests itself out. Probably one of the greatest expressions of worship in the Bible is when the jar of perfume worth the year's wages was broken and anointed the feet of Jesus. The extravagance of the resources financially that were expressed because there was a recognition of his worth. There was a recognition of who he was. But, but not even just that, the fact that the expression of worship was to kneel down, to anoint his feet, and then to, to wipe his feet with her hair. One of the most extravagant displays of worship. It didn't involve music and song, even though worship can but it, it was this incredible expression that came out of the heart. You know, we were created to worship. We are beings that will worship. The question isn't whether if you'll worship, the question is what are you going to worship? There are things that want to steal your worship away. They want to steal the affection of your heart so that you'll love them instead of loving Him. And that's why it's so good to be part of a body that loves the Lord, that, you know, talks about Jesus, that desires the full revelation of who He is and what He is, that talks about salvation and the gospel, to be able to see how kind He has been to you, that nobody has loved you like He has. No one has given so much to you than He has. Understand that He is worthy of it all. We talked last time, very quickly before we get into today, we talked last time about how worship is not a, a, a frivolous experience. It's not a, there's so much meaning and depth when we worship because the Bible says, yet you are holy and inhabit the praises of your people. 
worship and the presence of God always go hand in hand. When you see Jesus as he really is, you'll worship. When you worship, you'll experience the manifest presence of God. They, they, they go hand in hand. And worship provides this atmosphere. We, we said last time, if in heaven there is worship that's happening 24-7, then when we join in, when we worship, we are joining with heaven to see heaven expressed on earth. It's always good to know what's going on in heaven because when you partner with heaven, <laughs> you're doing the right thing. When you partner with heaven, heaven comes to earth. That's why when you have a vision of a man, you know exactly what God wants to do in that moment. And when you see that person or you hear that word, go to the park that's by the church then he all of a sudden lines up his will of what he's wanting in heaven and it expresses itself on earth. So turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel 6. This is such a popular portion of Scripture. Second Samuel 6, verse 12. I'm going to read a few verses. Now, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. With rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. This portion of scripture, um, we often remember it because of the way that David danced, but there's something important that happened here as well. The presence of God represented by the ark was brought back to the city of Jerusalem. It was brought back to its rightful place. And again, it's just this example of the two things going hand in hand. Of the, where, you know, where the presence of God is, there's extravagant worship. And where there's extravagant worship, the presence of God is. Remember in the, uh, the triumphal entry, Jesus came into his purpose, into his destiny, back into the city with extravagant worship, with extravagant praise. As they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And as they laid down their robes for Jesus to come into the city. So we have these two things happening at the same time. In verse 20, Michael, like I read, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants 
as any vulgar fellow would. Michael didn't have an understanding of extravagant worship. She didn't have an understanding of the value of the presence of God and that this really was a reason to celebrate because the, the presence is here, because God is here. And our new covenant, I mean, He is here. We don't have to go to an ark or go to a temple. God is with us. He lives inside of us. And it's always a time to celebrate. It's always a time to worship. She looked at David's expression through a worldly lens. She called vulgar what God called good. It was an incorrect judgment of authentic, genuine worship. Now, Michael, Michael, I believe, displayed both a political spirit and a religious spirit. I believe what was going on here was that these two spirits were influencing her, and those spirits caused her to misjudge to incorrectly judge an expression of extravagant worship. She looked at something that God thought was beautiful and called it humiliating, called it vulgar, couldn't see it for what it really was. Both of these spirits, both the political and the religious spirit, resist extravagant worship. Both of these spirits misjudge the move of God. So the, the political spirit is concerned with self-image. It's concerned with the opinion of the crowd. What, what's the crowd going to think of me? What's the person beside me going to think of me? The political spirit is concerned with the people's opinions, the, the crowd's thoughts. She was worried about how David was being displayed in front of all of Israel, right? Look how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today disrobing in the sight of slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. The political spirit concerned with self-image, the fear of man, which Proverbs says will prove to be a snare, partners with the political spirit. It thrives under a political spirit, the fear of man that's instilled that says, I'm thinking more about other people than I'm actually thinking about God and about what he's concerned about. The political spirit, we actually see it represented uh, not in Jesus' lifetime. It was expressed throughout the Gospels. We see uh, Herod. Let's take Herod first and foremost. We see Herod right at the point of Jesus' birth. Herod is so threatened. He's so threatened by... Um, He's so threatened by the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming. He, his leadership position is so threatened. In the political spirit, we see jealousy. We see insecurity come forward. We see Herod's insecurity so much so that he starts to kill, I think it was all the boys under two years of age. Where the spirit, where the political spirit is allowed to reign, you will find death and destruction, enough that would take out a generation. And the political spirit, even today, is still trying to do the same thing. It's trying to take out a generation. To be concerned about the crowd, to be concerned about how many followers do I have on Facebook, how many likes do I have, about the opinions of other people in my life, the political spirit drove Herod, because he was threatened, drove Herod to kill a generation. Wherever the political spirit is, you'll find death and destruction. And this is manifested physically, but in our day and age, it may manifest spiritually. If a political spirit is allowed to reign and rule, if it's allowed to express itself, It'll leave you in a place of unfruitfulness. It'll leave you in a place where you're allowing death to manifest maybe in the visions or the purposes of God for your life. We also see the political spirit at the end of Jesus' life. You've got Pilate. Pilate here in this place of leadership trying to make a decision. And 
the political spirit, the fear of man is on him so much so that he actually relinquishes his leadership role to make a decision and says, well, whatever the crowd says, let's just put Jesus before the crowd. And whatever the crowd says is what we'll go with because that'll protect my position in leadership. Then I can't take responsibility. Wherever a political spirit is allowed to operate, leadership is undermined. Leadership is usurped. And as the Bible says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The only way the kingdom of heaven continues to move forward in the earth, the only way revival continues to move forward is when the government of God can continue to be established. But the political spirit will undermine that government, trying to remove leaders, remove leadership, remove responsibility from leadership. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we've got the religious spirit, and it's concerned with control. It wants God in a box. It directly opposes revival because it looks wild. The religious spirit will say, I want this much God, but I know if I get this much, I will lose control of my life. When God did one of the most radical transformations in the Bible, when he took Saul of Tarsus and turned him into the Apostle Paul that wrote like a third of our New Testament, (laughs) he, he did it without Saul, Paul's permission. Sometimes we need an encounter that is beyond our control that is outside our sphere of control to release us into the fullness of the purposes of God for us. The spirit of religion will minimize your impact in the earth today. It'll minimize your purpose. It'll minimize what you're able to accomplish. The religious spirit is full of judgment. It's full of judgment, just like Michael judged David. Look, there is, I said this the other day to somebody. I did a study once on judgment. There is a judgment that leads to condemnation. But there is also a judgment that lets you recognize what's happening in the situation, not to condemn it, but to bring salvation to it. So when you see something in your brother and sister that may be harming them or hurting them, You don't judge them to condemn them. You don't judge them. Why are you doing that? You're ruining your life. You say, you know, I see this happening. Can I pray for you? Can I offer help? Can I come alongside you? There's a (laughs) judgment with condemnation that comes from the religious spirit. It wants to squash passion. It wants to squash authentic encounters with God. It wants to solidify relationship. Uh, It wants to take relationship and, uh, I'm missing the word. It wants to take relationship and turn it into a form. It's the form of, of godliness but denying its power. The spirit of religion wants to remove the power of God in the church and in your life so that you're ineffective so that your life can't change and you can't change anybody else's. I woke up yesterday and uh, I felt the Lord, remember I told you I've, I've got this picture of what, of what I'd love services to look like? You remember that picture? Anybody remember? The cloud fills the temple and the priests couldn't perform their service because of the cloud? That's an awesome picture. I got another picture yesterday. Do you remember when uh, Jesus is in, in the garden and the army comes to get him to take him away to the cross? It's in, uh, it's in John 18, and I'll, I'll read you what it says. They say, you know, where is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? It says, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Sounds like what happened in Ecuador. They drew back and fell to the ground. 
when the voice of the Lord is allowed to be heard, power is available. But the religious spirit wants to squash the voice of the Lord. Do you, do you remember that, um, that time in history between the covenants? I believe it was 400 years. 400 years between the old and the new covenants. And it says that God was silent. His voice wasn't heard. And then all of a sudden, we have our New Testament, and we see what happens over a 400-year span when God is silent. Religion was allowed to run rampant. And all of a sudden, we've got these groups leading in the day, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, and they've got these elaborate robes. And we all know what Jesus thought of those people, you brood of vipers. Hey, you wash the outside of the cup, but not the inside. Where the voice of God is not allowed, religion is allowed. By saying no to the voice of the Lord and saying no to His participation in our services, in our lives, and in our fellowship, we actually allow the spirit of religion to come and, and wreak havoc. A form of godliness, but denying its power. The religious spirit is directly opposed to revival. <laughs> Somebody's enjoying the message. These, these two spirits are trying to squash the move of God in the earth today. Let's finish with this verse. Verse 23, and it's very strategic that the best communicator of all time puts this at the end of this story. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. The lack of appreciation for extravagant worship, the lack of gratitude and thanksgiving led to barrenness. It led to a life of unfruitfulness. Our position in worship can directly affect the outcome of our purpose. And in this story, despising extravagant worship led to barrenness. Allowing the religious and political spirits to influence us will lead us to barrenness. We can't ask for the nations as our inheritance and then allow political and religious spirits to operate in our midst. When the presence of God and David's extravagant worship were expressed, it rendered the political and religious spirits barren. You want to know how to combat these two things? In extravagant worship in hearts of honor and gratitude and affection and thanksgiving towards the Lord that expresses itself in uh, anointing his feet with a jar of perfume that costs a year's wages. We can render these spirits barren with expressions of worship, authentic worship, by hungering and thirsting for the presence, the manifest presence of God in our meetings and in our lives. These spirits seem to have freedom to operate until extravagant worship and the presence were present. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me this morning?